let's start talking about Freenet. So what I want to start with is I took this talk right here and I went on to the Freenet IRC and I talked to the lead developer and I talked to several other developers at Freenet and I gave them this talk ahead of time. That's why this says 11th, February 11th, because I got this thing done and I handed this off to these guys and asked them to review it. Now I'm going to tell you up front, they had some disagreements with some of the wording that I used. Uh, they particularly didn't like when I used things like claims. They wanted me to use something stronger than claims, but I wasn't willing to do that, so I didn't make that change. Um, simply because, and we'll talk about this here in a minute, some of the stuff that goes on in some of these projects that we'll address later. But they did review it. I was told that this was a pretty good talk and that they mostly approved of it. So let's start with the Freenet project itself. So this is the Freenet web page. And this is where you're going to go if you want to pull down a copy of Freenet, if you want to be able to look at some of their wiki stuff. Essentially, this is going to be your main hub for where you're going to head as you want to learn more about this, because we're going to kind of do a very wide overview. Then we're going to break down some of the court cases that Freenet is involved in. And then we're going to move on to installing it and things like that. So censorship resistant communications. Does anybody want to tell me what the key word here that we all need to be aware of when I say that? What resistant, thank you. Resistant, not proof, not guaranteed, not trust your life to this thing at all times because no matter what you do, you're never going to get caught. It's censorship resistant communication. It's an opportunity for you to get data out on the internet in a manner in which other people can gain access to it while reducing the chance that others are going to be able to go in and stop them from being able to do that. Okay, this is really, really important. This is probably the most important part of this talk. And if you get nothing else, understand that it is censorship resistant communication. Okay. Now, again, I'm using the word claims. And I told them that when I'm done with this, I'm going to give them the video. So I apologize that I'm keeping that in there. But Freenet claims to be a peer-to-peer -peer platform to enable and promote communication and publishing without the fear of interference. And Freenet provides the ability to browse websites, post to forums, and publish files while enjoying strong privacy protections. And it is a platform for publishing that does not and cannot silence the user. So what does that mean? You cannot really go to the open internet from Freenet. Okay, so you're not going to use this for communicating on Facebook. You're not going to use this for heading on over to YouTube. It's not going to function in that manner. What you're going to use this for is for distribution. Now, obviously, you can go to YouTube DL, and you can pull down a YouTube video, and then you can compress it, and then you can serve that file up straight over Freenet. Okay? That's, you got to kind of think outside the box as you're using a tool like this. Uh, Let's compare this to Tor. With Tor, you have access to an internal network, right, with onion sites. And then in addition to that, you have exit nodes that allow you to jump out into the live internet, right? Is everybody familiar with that concept between an internal network and then an external network within Tor? Yes? We good? OK, cool. Then I will continue. Freenet doesn't really function that way, OK? Freenet is a little bit different of tool. And I do want to make this statement up front. I really like Freenet. If you've come to any of my previous talks and you've listened to me discuss some of these products and tools and the way that they're used, I have a huge problem with the way that the internet works. I like Gopher. Give me text files. Give me images. Give me video. Give me whatever. Everything's the same. It's very easy to go after. Um, we don't really have that anymore. If you look at some of these web pages nowadays, they're serving you data that adds up to 750, 800, 900 megabytes worth of stuff that they dump to your browser every time you go to their web page. Uh, the New York Times is bigger than Doom, like the video game Doom. You could get Doom on floppies. You can't fit 
the New York Times on floppies, okay? So just to give you kind of a, a, an idea of where we're at, all right? Now, I mentioned publishing. They do not and cannot silence the user. That's going to be more important here in a moment. But it's a philosophy that they have, which is extremely important. It's their thought process to how they do things. It's how they implement things. And it's how they work with the public on this project. Okay, So let's keep that in mind. So to me, privacy is really important. And some of you are probably going to be like, well, man, I'm working at the police station, blah, 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 like privacy. Who would have thought, right? Privacy is a counterweight to the amount of force that others can exert on us without our consent. Full stop. That's what privacy is. I can share information with you, but I'm trusting you with that data, right? Uh, whatever that data might be. And for certain people, I don't need them to know that I work at the police department. And for certain people, I don't need them to know that I use Linux. It's just the people that I want to share that information with, I do so. And for other people, I don't. And that's based on my consent. I get to make that decision. This counts for all of you as well, OK? Because if a person is well informed about us, we are less likely to be able to voice unpopular opinions, posit questions, take any kind of action that could be construed as outside the norm. You can't ask questions anymore if you have to live in fear. I don't like that idea. I don't want people to live in fear. A lack of privacy prevents people from being able to think for themselves for fear of being punished or ostracized by the group. Anybody ever heard of the term doxing? A couple of heads nodding. OK, for those of you who don't know the word doxing or don't understand it, doxing is about documents. It's the act of going on the internet or using whatever tools are made available to you, including breaking into cell phone records or contacting companies, gathering information about a target, and then releasing that information in a manner designed to harm that person. Oftentimes, doxing is done in conjunction with an action called swatting. Everybody know swatting? OK. For those of you who don't, I saw a couple of heads not nod. So if you're not participating, you get the full answer, OK? Um, Swatting is the act of calling in a fake emergency in order to draw in law enforcement to react in some way, uh, in a negative manner. If you were here for my last class, we did the roundup where we discussed all the stuff that happened. Uh, we just had our first two swatting deaths where people actually died doing, due to swatting. Um, an individual up in Kansas, he was gunned down, didn't have anything to do with the swatting. The guy just picked the wrong house. Called in a SWAT team, sent him over there. They shot this dude. He was a father of three, uh, single father, father of three, taking care of a bunch of kids. And they shot him right in front of his house, thinking that he was involved in this situation that this other guy called in. If you want to learn more, you can follow through to some of the other talks that I've done. And you can see that. We haven't had the video put up yet, but we will. But uh, you can still read the notes and such. That's important, OK? Privacy allows you to do things without worrying about somebody taking your information and putting it out on the internet and saying the words, well, you know what to do with this, which I have seen on Twitter. Everybody knows what action to take with this data. We want to be able to enhance our privacy. We want to be able to make the decision on who will and will not be able to look at whatever it is that we want to provide them. You need to be able to have a platform. Anybody know what's probably a majorly effective tool for silencing discourse on the internet? DDoS. Denial of service. Because if I don't like what you say and you are hosted on a specific platform, Potentially, I can go and I can gather the resources necessary to either cause enough of a stink that your provider is going to just cancel you because you're toxic and they don't want to deal with your toxicity. Or I'm going to bring those servers to their knees and eventually they're going to kick you off the platform anyways. You should not use Freenet if your main goal is to post on Facebook, surf YouTube, or use tools like Gmail. That's not what this thing is for. Okay. 
Freenet is for individuals introduced, interested in contribution and discussion. It's about content, and we're going to get to that as well. Now, everybody here have a GitHub? Yes? If you do not have a GitHub account, you need to get some kind of GitHub or GitLab account. I don't care what you use, but I'm on GitHub, and I'm using GitHub pages for my stuff here. So if you notice, there's a spelling mistake. You should not use Freenet if you main goal. Down at the bottom, you can actually click on GitHub, and you can go to this project, and you can fork it, and then you can send me a pull request to fix these things. For, I, I get this asked pretty much at the end of every class. What can I do to, to contribute to projects? How do I start building a footprint that shows people that I know how to use Git, know how to do a little bit of programming, so on and so forth? This is an opportunity for anybody who wants to do so. You can pull this thing, fix that word, and then I will accept the change request, and you can add this to your GitHub, OK? So if you don't have a lot of projects that you've worked on, this is how you get started, OK? Because if you don't, within a few days, I'm going to go in here and fix this myself, just FYI. And there's a couple other places where I made mistakes, too. So how does Freenet work? Well, if you click on this link, Kent State University gives a fantastic breakdown on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, the impact of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, and several peer-to-peer -peer applications, including Nutella, BitTorrent, and Freenet. So if you would like the scientific background to how Freenet functions and what Freenet does and how it's working on the back end, this right here is a great way to get started talks about several products, it talks about how they communicate and the way that these, excuse me, tools function. It's kind of dry, so that's not really what we're going to focus on, okay? <coughs> Let's start with how to install it and then we'll move forward from there. Now I just asked you all about GitHub and I introduced GitHub and I talked it up real, real big. Guess what? Freenet is on GitHub, okay? And I already did all the hard work for you. And this right here is the free net, free net um, daemon. And this right here is the project for you to be able to work with Freenet. Now, I usually ask, I see some new faces in here, so we're going to do this question. I'm sure some of you have heard this before. Everybody has heard that Linux is very, very secure because there's many, many eyes looking at it, correct? Lots and lots of eyes on Linux, so it's very, very secure. Anybody here who has read every single line of the Linux kernel, please raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. It's just, we just don't. Everybody's kind of in that mindset that, well, somebody's looking. Somebody will look. They'll find it. Somebody will find it. And potentially they will, maybe 20 years later. Look at what's going on with Spectre, right? That has been a, a bug within the code for about 20 years. And guess what? We found it. Somebody located it. But it took 20 years to get to that point. Okay. So what I want you all to do is when you have time, just look. Look at the contribution team. Look at some of the, um, look at some of the commits. Start checking out these pull requests. There's a ton of stuff that is informational including if you start looking at these pull requests. I want to point this out. Where is it? Um, they have bugs. They have, uh, I should have I pulled this up earlier. I apologize. But as you go through this, they have a whole bunch of security issues that they're actually reviewing publicly. So you can see problems that are within the system and how they're discussing how to fix them. In addition to that, they have an IRC that you can go to so you can sit in on their IRC. This is a good project, and I'm urging everybody here to actually go sit down and read, see what they're doing, see how they're working, and see how they interact. Okay, All of this is available to you, and I'm not sure. Maybe everybody here already knows that. Maybe you know that you can go to it, but the problem that we have is even though we know we can all go to the kernel, that we can all go see it, Somebody else is doing it, right? But if you're going to be using this tool, especially if you're going to be using it for your privacy or potentially using it to provide 
a method of communication for somebody in a non-permissive environment? Well, you should probably know what you're doing with this tool and how it's used and what kind of concerns these people have. So you don't have an excuse. You got to stop. You got to look at the tool. You need to know how it is made and who is making it, who's contributing to it. If you're not familiar with it, you're not going to be ready when somebody shows up to sabotage this thing and starts making changes that you can identify as a problem. And we'll get into that in a little bit too. Now for me, I host things externally. I don't like to keep things internally on my network. Now, I come from the United States. I work in law enforcement. Everybody knows I deal with all of these tools. Everybody knows that I talk about this stuff all the time. Everybody knows that you can get a hold of me online in all kinds of different chat programs and on Signal and in IRC, and you can hit me up on Keybase and so on and so forth. And I'm always there answering questions about all of these tools. So for me, I'm OK with hosting my installation somewhere else. Uh, when I was discussing this with the Freenet developers, some of them had a very, very strong opinion that it should be on your personal hardware within your reach and it should not be installed anywhere that you can't physically grab that box. Okay? And then some of them were just like, well, as long as you pick a place you're happy with, it's probably fine. And now this is where we're going to start getting into that threat matrix. What matters, what doesn't. I have a link here that says acquire hosting. And I will open this real quick. Well, it's going to open anyways. So this is Scaleways. I love these people. They're in France and Amsterdam. And one of the coolest things about them is they have a C1 bare metal SSD cloud server for $2.99 euro that comes out to like $3 and some change, I think, right now. Uh, where you get four dedicated ARM v7 cores, two gigs of memory, and 50 gigabyte SSD disk. I have one of those, and then I have one of these C2 series, uh, or I'm sorry, I have one of these ARM64 series. You can check this out if you want to. That link doesn't have any kind of referral thing. I don't get paid for this. And again, nobody's um, like, getting anything out of it. I'm just telling you about it, okay? And if you guys don't like it, that's fine. But pick your favorite country, pick a provider, get yourself a VPS. You don't have to spend more than three or four bucks to do it, and you can install this thing off-site. Now, I'm going to give you a short explanation about why I feel that this is a good idea. Everybody got to read all the NSA leaks and all the other stuff that was coming out, right? You guys stopped, took a look at some of those documents that were coming in and some of the PowerPoints that came out and the explanations of how they were targeting people, right? Well, I hope you did. I hope you actually stopped to look at that stuff and you didn't let it just get filtered down by somebody else who interpreted it for you. But if you didn't, I'm going to interpret it for you. At a certain point within one of those PowerPoint files, uh, NSA leaked out that one of their main targets were users of Linux Magazine. So if you had a Linux Magazine subscription, you were a potential target for the NSA because you were considered dangerous because you use Linux. You're a little too smart for them and for their liking. And that was right in their PowerPoint. So in addition to that, they also check the traffic on all the houses here within the U.S. So whatever it is that you're doing on your home network, it's going to go most likely up to Utah, and it's going to get dumped into a great big old building that they occasionally take pictures of the outside of and put on the internet. And then from there, they can see what you're doing at your home. And maybe they see that you have a VPN and that you have VPN traffic and that you've been to a web page about Tor or I2P or Freenet or Nutella or whatever, so on and so forth. But guess what? They're actually looking for that stuff. And within their PowerPoint documentation, it says, we're looking for that because those people are dangerous, too smart. They know too much. We need to pay attention to those people. Because the only reason why they would be looking at that stuff if it was, is because they're up to no good, which that's an attitude I don't like. I don't believe that. I don't think that that's true. 
Um, what do I know, right? I'm just a guy who works at the police department. But when I look at privacy, I look at it as an opportunity to defend your rights. I look at it as an opportunity for you to make the decision about what you want to share with other people. And if you don't want to share your love for, you know, hell, I don't know, whatever, uh, those little dolls that are made out of, like, ceramic, you know what I'm talking about. I, sure, that's fine. If you don't want people to know about that, that's okay. That's your prerogative, okay? Now, I also have a host country list. You buy hosting from one of these places, you're probably going to end up on that list, okay? I'm just going to name off some of these places, Panama, Hong Kong, Seychelles. I didn't even know that place existed until I started doing research on this. So Slovakia, Hungary, Russia, Syria, Turkey, and yes, I actually did go and find, and I'm probably on a list somewhere too, uh, Syria has very, very inexpensive hosting right now. It may not be very reliable. And I did test the speeds, and it's a little slow. It's about 150 kilobits per second, okay? That's about the max. I maxed it out at about 150 kilobits. But for about $2 and some change US, you can get yourself a little VPS out there in Syria, okay? Now, that's going to open. What's that? Does it route through Israel? I, you know, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question, actually. The Turkey, actually. Yeah. <laughs> So you have a ton of different places where you can go and you can pick a VPS from. Again, it all comes back to what's your threat, what are you worried about, where do you want to host it, and in addition to that, in the unlikely but potential event that you get pulled up in front of either a police officer or a judge, what do you want to have to explain? Now, when I talk to my students, I'm going to explain to you exactly how I tell my students. Everybody here looks like you were probably alive, except for one of you, uh, back when Saturday night specials were a thing. Everybody remember that term? It was for a handgun. And they would say, there's a Saturday night special. And I remember as a child, I actually told my mother, we need to buy one of those. I don't know what that is, but that thing scares people, and we should have that in the house. My mother was a single mother, and essentially I, I lived with her, and we lived in a rough neighborhood. But the idea behind the Saturday night special of this like scary, terrible, awful thing that is dangerous for everybody, you don't want to be the person with the Saturday night special. Do you know what I mean? Especially when you're standing in front of somebody who's 78 years old and doesn't know what the internet is, doesn't understand any of these terms. You don't want to be that guy. Just like some of you are my students previously, and I've walked through my classrooms and looked at the stickers on people's computers and told them, you don't want that sticker on your computer if a police officer is interviewing you. That's a dumb move. Take that off. You don't want to be that person. So again, pay attention to what it is that you're doing, make smart choices, and choose depending on what the threat is, okay? And then, of course, I have a link right here. It says, get the installer. Surprise, surprise, it takes you to the installer. I even have some instructions here. You can wget that file, pull it onto your VPS, and then upon doing so, you got to use Java. Now, oh yeah, Freenet is done in Java, and that's also another important thing to understand. Now, it is not the Java that is hooked up to your web browser and is being used to exploit your system. This is an actual like Java runtime, okay? It's the jar, and then you're going to run it. Uh, some people don't want to have Java on their system, but if you're running headless and you're not running a browser and you're not allowing the Java to be run within the browser, it may not be as bad. Again, this is up to you to make that decision. Everybody here can make the decision of looking at that code base, looking at how it runs, and then decide yes or no. Again, I don't run this stuff on my local computer, okay? That's another thing to keep in mind. And then, once we've done all that, we're still going to want to access this stuff locally. And most of what you're going to do with Freenet is actually going to be done within the web browser. 
So how are we going to do that? If we have this running on a server and we don't want other people to have access to configuration and making changes, well, it's really easy. We're going to use a tunnel. And we've talked a little bit on tunnels in here using SSH tunnels. Um, I'm going to break it down for you. The idea behind the SSH tunnel is, is we make a connection between our computer and another computer, and we make those ports that we choose available to us so that on our local host, we can hit a specific port, and really what we're doing is interacting with the port on the remote system. Make sense? Everybody follow? Perfect. So SSH switch capital L for Lima, and then you set your ports. Uh, default ports are 8888, 127.0.0.1, .0 and then 8888, and then whatever login connection information that you need to actually access the system. Uh, I actually recommend that you either turn this into some sort of bash uh, like shortcut. You can create a little shortcut in bash. If you use fish, it's real easy to make a little function to be able to do this. Pick your poison, whatever it is that you want to be able to do. Make sure you're using SSH keys, secure the server correctly. I probably shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. When you set up your server, remember, don't just jump in there and start turning software on. Firewall updates. Make sure that your system is locked down first. Nothing, no access to any ports except for port 22. And then from there start to open up because we're going to be opening other ports. Okay. Once you've done that, we can then open a local browser and then surf over to localhost 8888. That allows us to gain access to that system's configuration system. You do not want to nor need to expose ports 8888 to the internet, okay? Don't go into UFW and enable 8888 or anything like that on the server, okay? When you make this, it's as though you are locally within the box when you make this tunnel, okay? And then the very first thing that you'll probably want to do is head on over to status and internet connection to get your ports. And there you can use your firewall to open the ports. The ports are going to be different for every person. That's why I haven't written them down. Part of the security of this is making it so that somebody can't just go start scanning servers on the internet, knowing what port to look for to find free net installations, OK? It's, a, it's an idea of making it a little bit more ambiguous. So setting up Freenet is actually kind of daunting. It really is, especially the first time you go through it, because it looks super janky. It really does. Sorry, guys. Uh, when you set up this thing, it's essentially you're going to go through, and you're going to have some drop-down boxes and so on and so forth, and it's going to be a lot of hitting next with a whole bunch of warnings about potentially this can get you in trouble, and this is dangerous, and that is dangerous, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to kind of break it down for you for a new user, what you need to do and how you need to make those decisions. First thing we need to be thinking about is how popular we are. What are we really concerned about? Now, if we were a Falun Gong practitioner living in China, well, we might have some different concerns than somebody chilling here in Arizona who wants to be able to post copies of their latest homemade manga, okay? Which both of those things are on Freenet. How popular are you? How many eyes are going to be on you? What is the issue going to be if somebody finds out that you are a Freenet user? What do you need to be concerned about? Now, our ultimate goal is to run under everything under maximum security levels. That'd be fantastic. If we could just crank up the security levels to maximum on everything, lock the whole box down, and just let this thing fly, well, that'd be great. A lot less concerns about who's going to be looking at it, how they're going to use it, what kind of ways they're going to manipulate it. Then we're just worried about who's going to find the next vulnerability and how quickly are we going to be able to realize that they're using it, especially against us, OK? It's almost impossible to do that, though. We're not going to be able to do that. Because you have to be able to build trust and community with other users to use this thing to its maximum. And to be honest with you all, that's just not a thing that happens anymore. So for those of you who don't know, this is sort of a part one in a four-part series that we're going to end up doing. 
where we're starting with Freenet because I really like Freenet and I think this is a great product and I really like what they're doing and I really like the idea behind Freenet. Then we're going to move to I2P. And for those of you who know that I've complained for almost a year about I couldn't get I2P to work, I got it to work. <laughs> so I finally got I2P running and we're going to move on to that next. And then eventually we're going to go to Tor. And then from there, we're going to start talking about some of the technologies that are coming back and making a big breakthrough. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am a ham radio operator. And in addition to that, I am working with sort of independently but with other people to build um, what is packet over radio. So we're building what amounts to a 9600 baud to 1200 or 12,000 baud uh, network over radio so that we can communicate. There's actually a thing called Network 105 that runs at 300 baud on high frequency radio and allows you to connect with people all over the world. Which means if you're going to be doing that, your communication has to be much shorter. It has to be um, much easier to transport because we're heading way back in time. Okay, But we're going to go over all of that over the next few months. So where are we? I consider us in the user in the United States here, I would consider us in general a high confidence society. I have high confidence in the rule of law. I have high confidence in our law enforcement. I have high confidence in government in terms of they're not going to just kick in your door and come in and wipe you out. Uh, there are countries where that happens. Okay, if you're using products like this, people lose their lives in specific countries. Here, that would be much rarer. Okay. Uh, within the U.S., I feel that you can use normal and high protection. So security level of normal, high protection for your downloads, uploads, and free net browsing cache, and uh, we can be discovered to be using free net here with some reliability, but you're going to contribute to the network. The size of the network is going to grow. There's going to be more available for everybody to use. Remember, this is a peer-to-peer -peer system. So if you're not putting into the system, you're not going to really be able to use this thing. It's going to ask you to set a good password. Do it. Use your password manager. Uh, pay attention to what you're doing. Everybody here knows, correct? Don't use the same password everywhere. Use a strong password, use a password manager, so on and so forth. I shouldn't have to explain these things, but oftentimes we do have to retouch on that. And then in addition to that, they do warn you, and I'm a firm believer in this as well. Be wary of your mannerisms, your screen name use. How did they get Dread Pirate Roberts? Anybody know? Anybody know who Dread Pirate Roberts is? Isn't that from Princess Red? No, well, yes. But also, that's the screen name that was used by the guy who was running Silk Road. So that guy, the Silk Road guy, Dread Pirate Roberts, uh, what he did was he made Silk Road. But there was nobody using it, OK? So he went on Stack Overflow with his username and his email. And he started asking questions. How do I fix these things? Silk Road's kind of broken. I need some help with this. And then he started going on web forums, Bitcoin forums, and posting using his email and his username. And all of and his email actually consisted of, I believe, his first and last name. OK, keep this in mind. And started posting questions to people about, well, if you were looking for a place to buy and sell drugs, what would you be looking for? And then eventually, from there, he moved on to advertising. So he was advertising Silk Road using his real life persona. OK? And somebody was smart enough to sit down and start searching for the earliest time that Silk Road was ever mentioned. That was sort of their goal. Let's find out when the first time Silk Road was ever mentioned. And once we figure that out, we're going to go back through all of those usernames and so on and so forth until we track this guy down. And so they did. And they found his real name. And then, long story short, uh, they ended up pretending to have a like boyfriend-girlfriend fight in front of him. And while he was watching that, 
the female agent turned around, grabbed his laptop after he had unlocked it, and ran out of a coffee shop. So that's how they snatched his stuff and went from Silk Road being the most dangerous place in the entire world, and we have to grab these people, and we got to do anything to find these people, down to we're just going to pretend to have an argument and then steal his computer. And it was because he used his real name out on the internet. Screen name use. Uploading files with metadata. When you take a picture of yourself, oftentimes it will add what? Information about your cell phone, GPS coordinates, information about the computer that it was hooked up to, so on and so forth. There's a ton of information available for almost every single kind of file type. Okay. If you put that stuff out on the internet, somebody can pull it down and look at all of that stuff. Uh, even in this class, what have we talked about? Steganography, right? You can take an image, put more stuff inside of that image, and then go send it out into the world. People look for that stuff constantly. That's not unheard of anymore. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a secret. Metadata, steganography, that's what they're looking for. Now, how about low confidence? This is where we start getting into more groundwork, OK? Uh, anybody here ever do a signing party? Key, key trading? You go out, you register a, a, a PGP key, and then you come in, and you do trading to make sure that everybody can physically see you, shake your hand, and then sign your key. No? We've done, a, we've done it a few times here at Plug. I know we have. OK, well, anybody here using Keybase after I talked about that? Yeah? OK, cool. Actually, you'll add me on Keybase at some point. Retro64, XYZ. Hit me up on Keybase. Uh, again, it's a method of being able to trade these secure keys with each other so that you can communicate with each other and actually know who they are. Now, I talk about this in another talk, but I'm going to touch on it right here because it's important. Uh, sometimes, it's not so much about being able to hide who you are as it is about being able to prove who you are. Okay. Sometimes businesses are in a situation where somebody picks up the phone and calls them and says, hey, look, you need to send this money to the bank or we're not going to be able to meet payroll this month. Well, is it the bank or not? So being able to trade those keys and be able to work with that, that information allows you to do things a little bit more securely within your, your uh, circle. So again, similar to trading information during a signing party, what we want to be able to do is seek out like-minded individuals, trade connection data, and use high or maximum protection settings. Freenet's maximum protection settings requires for you to build what is known as a dark net. When they talk about a dark net, this is what they're discussing. A few of us get together. We all know each other. We visibly see each other. And each one of us hooks our um, Freenet installations together. OK? And that builds a inner core resiliency against other people being able to know who we are, but also protects us from being able to connect to other systems that we may not want to connect to. Uh, and they can be small groups or large groups, but obviously the most important part is, is that it's done with people you trust. Now, this I kind of have a problem with because, A, most of us are not going out and being very social. When the bell rings and we say that this class is over and everybody leaves, very, very few people are going to stop, turn around, shake somebody's hand, and go, hey, I want to get to know other Linux users a little bit better. And hey, we ought to set up a dark net here so that we can start communicating that way. In addition to that, for you to gain greater access to the network, you're still really going to need to have a few people who are running normal security. Okay, So essentially, the normal security person is going to connect to some of these people who are using high and maximum security in order to still funnel information from the greater net down into them while the rest of them are using the maximum protection to keep themselves safe. Again, it all depends on who you're communicating with and where and how, it, how the whole system on a whole functions. Don't connect to individuals you don't know. Don't just do it over the internet. You need to make sure that you know who the people are and that you trust them. And on the page, it's actually going to give you a giant warning that says, adding people as friends you don't know will not improve your security. OK? Just right there at the bottom. 
always use high protection for downloads and employ a strong password. Okay? Now, keep in mind, if you're on a VPS, anything that you're doing on that VPS is essentially available to the VPS provider. Uh, once you've got HTOP installed, or I'm sorry, once you've got Freenet installed, open up TOP or HTOP and then do a search for the word Freenet and you will see where Freenet is running within the system. If you can see that, they can see that, okay? Just rule of thumb right there. Anything that you download to the system is going to be available for anybody to view who connects and looks at the box. In addition to that, they regularly at most of these places do backups. They, they keep track of your system, okay? Usually for health and wellness. Make sure that it's okay. Make sure that all your files are still there. And if there's a major crash or whatever, they're going to try to recover all this stuff and get you back up and running, right? Well, that means all of that data is available there. It doesn't take anything for somebody to go out and get a warrant and hand that warrant over and say, I need access to this VPS and all the data that was stored on it and for them to cough that up. So I'm not here to tell you, oh, this is going to be the perfect way for you to go out and do dumb stuff that's going to get you in trouble. What I'm here to do is to tell you if you're worried about privacy and you're worried about taking care of yourself and you want to contribute to the greater good of everybody else who wants to use this product for privacy, then this is a way to do it. But it will not be a way to do it if you're worried about somebody kicking in a door and putting a bullet in your head because you were looking at Falun Gong stuff, okay? So just keep in mind, keep tracking on that. So let's move to one of the main worries, censorship, okay? And what I did was I went out and I looked for the biggest name in censorship right now, and that's the Daily Stormer. And if you don't know the Daily Stormer, um, they're sort of a, like, racist, white supremacist news organization that really picked up a lot of traction in terms of people paying attention to them. They had a Twitter account and they had access to social media and so on and so forth. They were doing the Web 2.0 thing to spread their message. And what ended up happening was people got angry about that. And they started complaining. And then after they started complaining, they actually started telling Cloudflare, uh, for those of you who do not know, let me take a step back here. Cloudflare is a company that provides DDoS protection as well as other services to essentially anybody who pays for it at the time. Okay, So when the Daily Stormer came under attack, they go to Cloudflare, they start paying their $12 a month. Cloudflare brings them under their umbrella just like they would do with any other company. And at that point, uh, people decided to stop targeting the Daily Stormer, and instead they targeted Cloudflare. Now that caused a lot of problems for the Cloudflare like upper management, and the guy who owns Cloudflare decided he was going to go jump on um, Twitter and start telling people, look, we're here to defend uh, free speech, we're here to do everything in our power to give everybody ample opportunity to do X, Y, and Z, and at first his message was a very specific way. And then that message changed. And uh, what he decided to do was he got on Twitter and started making some posts. And then at some point, he claims that he single-handedly uh, canceled the account for the Daily Stormer, took them off of Cloudflare protection. And then upon doing so, they immediately came down, like their web page was down. Because there was people constantly attacking it. There's DDoSs pointed at them at what amounted to a 24-7 basis, okay? Personal note, I feel that the action that was taken was done at the wrong time because of the fact that that was right around when we were talking about what? Network neutrality. So network neutrality was going up and they made the decision to essentially censor a company, whether for better or for worse, whatever you feel about those guys, doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is, is that they got up and they made this decision right in the middle of the network neutrality argument, right? So upon doing that, 
somebody was able to get up and say, well, if they can make the decision of who gets to be on or off the internet, how come Time Warner can't? And at that point, who could say? Well, why can't Time Warner decide who can and cannot be on the internet or how much they pay to be on the internet? They, they got to make that decision. $12.99 wasn't enough every month for them to stay on the internet, so they came off the internet. They're no longer on the internet, and they handed it off to them. I think that the, the decision to make that decision at that time was probably ill-conceived. It was not a good idea to do that when we were in the middle of the network neutrality battle. Personal opinion. But it didn't matter, because as soon as they were brought down, what did they do? They switched from an open server to a Tor hidden service. Now, for those of you who do not know what a Tor hidden service is, I'm going to go over that. We need, Tor provides an opportunity for you to build services within the Tor network that are only accessible from Tor that are designed to be resilient against you finding out where they're located. It's supposed to be relatively difficult for you to be able to, to deny a service attack. The, um, the, the, the hidden service itself, um, because essentially when you start sending a mass of traffic through, the surrounding nodes are going to start dropping and the traffic's never going to get to that box anyways. So they switch over to Tor and they're still running, you know, essentially business as usual. Uh, and because a Tor hidden service allows you to still run things like PHP, MySQL, JavaScript, all of the things that allow you to make a web page that makes money, they were still on and they were still doing business as usual, okay? At that point, the community at large, particularly the community of the Tor development group, they, uh, they get mad. And issue number 23270 is opened, okay? And what is asked, and I'm going to say this word for word and then I'll break it down for you. Allow Tor relays to be configured to block selected hidden services, including racist hate sites. That right there means we are looking for a way to begin to, to add the ability to silence sites using Tor. So they're going to need to implement a way of tracking these sites, of locating the sites, of cutting them off from the network. And once you do that, once you cross that privacy line, once you cross that line, you can't cross back. Because we can turn off the racist hate site, but then I can just point that exact same tool at the Falun Gong site. Or at the, I don't know, the Kachina doll site. Whatever site I want to turn off, <laughs> then at that point, I just point the gun right at that site. You build it, you arm it, and then it doesn't matter. It's just who's holding it and where they're pointing it, okay? Now, this turned into a huge issue, okay? You have half the people on here saying code like that doesn't exist, it should not exist, it will not exist, I will not contribute this. Uh, this individual right here says, insert slippery slope argument focused on Tor being coerced into censoring arbitrary onion services. Again, once you offer the opportunity to censor, then you can just censor. Doesn't matter who you're pointing it at, it becomes part of it. And some of the people said, well, this is really easy to implement. I can write something out real quick. You give me a Tor Onion address, and then I can just add it to like a blacklist. And then anybody can take Onion addresses and add them to a blacklist, and then they're blocked. But that also means that once those nodes start blocking access to that, if enough do that, then people cannot access the information, obviously. So you have two sides of the party asking, hey, this is, a, this is a feature, I want this, and other people saying this is a very dangerous thing, we do not want this. I recommend going through here and just reading the comments because it gives you both sides. Everybody got involved with this, okay? 
everybody, like the developers, the their uh, PR people. I mean, if you want to know what they went through during this period of time, this is your this is your magic opportunity. Um, people were spitballing all kinds of ideas during that that point. Now, at that point, finally the Tor network came out, and they decided. Their argument was, we are here to defend human rights, which means all human rights for all humans. That was their official statement. No matter who you are or what it is that you want to do, if you're going to use Tor, there are many more people who are using Tor for good than there are people using Tor for bad, and therefore they're going to side with the people who are using it for good. Uh, this blog post caused a huge I'm going to use the word riot amongst many of the individuals who worked on the Tor project or within it or around it. Uh, there was a lot of people who got really angry about this. Now, if you do not know the history of Tor, this originally started as a DARPA project, the Navy was involved. Essentially, the US government created Tor and then handed it off to the developers and told them, fly, do what you want to do with it. And they continued that. They built the Tor project. Many of the head developers stayed on. This, this project moved out. But the, the roots themselves were about providing people an opportunity to use the internet in a secure manner behind what amounts to enemy lines so that they could communicate out into the world. Okay, Which meant censorship, uh, any of those things are sort of the complete opposite of what they're trying to accomplish here. I was not surprised that their statement came out as we're not going to do that because they essentially they can't. There's too many people who rely on this for um, some things that doing something like this would not be a good idea. Okay, And I'm talking governments, I'm talking military, I'm talking just a ton of people are on this who are using it in the sort of the background noise amongst all the civilians who are using it as well. Now, at that point, Freenet comes out. Because other people came to Freenet and said, hey, we want you to censor people. What if they moved Freenet? What are you going to do? And they said, since the very beginning of the project until the end of the project, this project is going to take a binary attitude and that they, they believe that all speech should be allowed, but any speech can be challenged. No matter what you want to put on the free net network, fine. But if somebody wants to argue it or provide alternative content that is against that, then they're fine. Anybody can do that. I feel that that is the correct stance to take. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't silence a handful of people and then just kind of hope that they don't do the same to the other handful of people. Okay, The tool has to be made robust. It is what it is. Uh, it's another reason why I like the Freenet project. Now, is it a hill for them to die on? I don't know. They have not had a situation yet in which Freenet became the center of a topic like that. So who knows if they will or will not stick to it. You never know. But at this point in time, that is the statement that they have made. So now let's start talking about the attack vectors. Where is it vulnerable? What can people do to take this thing down or to reduce quality? So there are a handful of vulnerabilities that uh, potentially can reduce the quality of the network, halt access, or even poison results. There are certain physical issues that we're going to need to discuss as well that are very, very important that we all need to start keeping in mind. First place that I really want you all to go to, and maybe I can open this, maybe I can't. Here we go. So for those of you who have not done a lot of work with GitHub, GitHub has a method by which you can also create a wiki. So Freenet has their wiki uploaded directly to GitHub, and you can actually go here, and they go over a lot of their security issues. They talk about them in the open. It's not a hidden thing. The vulnerabilities are discussed. The ways of 
uh, manipulating those vulnerabilities, the ways of preventing those, those uh, vulnerabilities from being used. All of that information is done right up front. Okay, again, another reason why I like this project. I like the fact that they're willing to come out and give you different information on how to debug, how to work with it, how to test, all of that, it's right here. All served right up to you. Uh, first stop for anybody, okay? Check the code, get the thing installed, get it configured and set up, and the very next thing that you should be doing is starting the process of learning about how can this thing hurt me. Uh, for, um, for those of you who have been in my class, you may not know this, but the thing that I tell everybody is when you are working with these tools, the most important thing that you can learn is how does it harm me? Where does it hurt me? Where does this thing go from being a cool toy to a weapon? Um, think about the command rm. What does it do? It removes files. Great. I can rm a file and I can free up space on my computer. I can rm files whenever I need to, to get rid of them. I can rmrf and I can remove a folder and just knock that thing right out, right? And then I can sudo rmrf forward slash and slam that enter key and then what do I have? Well, yeah, I have a problem. Just lost information, potentially. A lot of information. Do I have backups? Do I have a way of getting all of this stuff back? What am I going to do? It's a tool that goes from being a tool to somebody breaking into my server and RMRFing the whole thing because they don't know what's on it. It's not valuable to them, but they just want to leave a message. So then they destroy the thing. Start learning, how does it hurt me? Now, I'm going to start with the physical. And this is important to me because I'm a military emergency management specialist. I've done a ton of FEMA classes. I've uh, done a lot of training on incident command, all of this stuff. And we do a lot of training on emergencies. Okay? Everybody's heard the term digital Pearl Harbor, right? No? Okay. So the idea behind the digital Pearl Harbor is eventually we are going to have an incident so grand and so destructive that it's going to either propel us into the next world war or it's going to cause endless amounts of destruction. Okay? And there's just an expectation that eventually it's going to happen. Somebody's going to figure out a way of bringing down every DNS server and the whole internet's going to go dark. Somebody's going to figure out a way of causing some kind of harm or attack that's going to end with essentially the entire planet not having internet access for any amount of time. Okay? And we've seen sort of tests of that. Uh, if you get on the internet and you start looking at uh, early 2000, late 90s internet attacks in South America, there are certain countries where European nations actually broke in to a certain country down in South America and figure out a way of making all of their telecommunications go blank for what amounted to almost 24 hours. Okay? So there's been practice for a while. People have been working on it, trying to figure it out. What can we do, where, how, and how can we cause the maximum amount of damage while potentially leaving as much of the infrastructure itself still in place. Because if you're not familiar with the military and how things work, oftentimes uh, in traditional warfare you go in and you destroy very specific targets, um, anti-aircraft stuff so that you can gain air superiority, right? Uh, you might destroy uh, a power plant, but you're going to leave the water plant in place because you know it's too expensive to replace that thing or to get it up and running. So instead, you take out the power plant knowing that you've already got parts to put that thing back together, and the next thing you know, you've got U.S. Army engineers in there putting that thing together after you've blown it up. But you just did enough to take over the land, and then you've got to get the place running again. Okay? So what have we done? Nobody's forgotten the Arab Spring yet, right? 
Yeah, a few of us? Okay. <coughs> so, the Arab Spring was a situation in which over there in uh, places like Egypt, a whole bunch of people decided they were going to make a bunch of changes. And so they started employing Twitter and Facebook and the internet. And they got together and they started a movement to remove certain people from power. And the Arab Spring lasted for a specific amount of time. And I'll leave it up to you to, to, to look it up if you're interested in these kind of things. But during this period of time, anybody ever see the picture of the guy who taped bread to the side of his head? It was kind of a famous picture because he didn't have a helmet. So he took loaves of bread and put them on his skull to protect himself. If you've ever seen that picture, that comes out of the, the Arab Spring, okay? Um, yeah, for rocks, because they were throwing rocks. And so to protect himself from rocks, he used bread to defend his skull. Uh, during that period of time, the United States noticed that the internet is a pretty cool weapon. It's got communications capability. You can send orders through it. You can rally people. You can provide maps and GPS coordinates. You can do a whole lot of things that traditionally would be done through secure communications, but they were doing it through a method that is not a secured communication route, and they were being effective. They were telling each other when they needed supplies. They were able to get medical into certain areas. There was a lot going on during that period. And so the US decided, well, then we need to implement a thing called SOP 303, Standard Operating Procedure 303. And I got links to it, so for anybody who wants to be able to look at this stuff, Epic is still in a court case about this, trying to, uh, Epic being the Electronic Privacy Information Center, not Epic, the, not the Border Patrol Epic. This is a different Epic, okay? Uh, SOP 303, break it down to you, bare minimum. Here's what it does. We can turn off the internet, we can turn off telecommunications, we can turn off anything that we need to within the United States to prevent a situation similar to the Arab Spring from happening here. So if people start using the internet to get together and decide how they're going to do things to um, cause any kind of disruption within the government, SOP 303 can kick in and they can turn it off. Turn it off physically. Boom, just pull the plug, your internet is gone, okay? Now, the issue that we have right now with SOP 303, other than the fact that it exists, is the fact that SOP 303 also means that uh, we don't actually know what's in it. Now, we've seen it in action, and we've seen it used. So we know some of the capabilities that are available just off of being able to witness it in use, but we don't actually know any of the rules or regulations involved on when we can kick this thing off when is appropriate and when is not appropriate to use it and so on and so forth. Now, of interest to me, and maybe of interest to some of you as well, is the fact that SOP 303, during the court argument on, hey, you guys need to release this so that we can know about it, the government said, it's cool, because if you're like a doctor or something and you need the internet to keep people alive, we'll just turn it on for you. And they said, well, how do, how do you figure out if they're a doctor? And they said, well, that's a secret. So that's weird to me. Um, that's kind of a problem. Because their expectation is, is that, well, we'll just switch off the internet for everybody except for a handful of people over here who might need it. But I don't know about you, but I'm not registered with the SOP 303 list. And I'm not sure how I would communicate with them in the event that they switched off the internet and I wanted to raise my hand and say, well, actually, I need the internet. Uh, but is a master's degree good enough to get to stay on the internet? I don't know. They're saying a doctorate is, but what kind of doctorate, right? So again, Epic is actually in the middle right now of a court case with DHS, Department of Homeland Security here in the US. They're asking for SOP 303 to be presented, uh, they're asking for FOIA documentation, so on and so forth. They want to know, when can it be used? Now, we know it has been used, okay? Let's just get this out of the way. Uh, during some of the riots that were going on in California, they realized that 
the rioters were using their cell phones to send text messages between each other. Uh, they realized that they were using web browsers to send emails off of their phones. And so the government actually went in and shut down telecommunications on cell phones as well as on web pages. Can you write it down and keep it to the end? Or is Which riot? I was... um, That's all. Google it because I didn't write it down. But what they did was they shut down a four block radius. And when you look up the case, you'll actually see it referenced within the case. That's why I'm giving you all this information. So you can look it all up if you want to. Uh, and I don't want to give you any wrong information, but they shut down about a four block radius. So your cell phone stopped working, uh, internet stopped working in that area. They just shut the whole place down. There was no talking in and out of that location anymore. So that's pretty pinpoint to me. When I think in a big picture kind of thing, if you can shut down a four block area of cell phones, of internet, of anything like that, that's fairly pinpoint accurate. So they've built a pretty good system for SOP 303 already. This isn't a flip off the internet and we accidentally shut down all of California. This is a, I need this grid turned off, hit it. And they can hit that grid and it's off. So Freenet, Tor, Nutella, all these other cool peer-to-peer -to -peer tools, well guess what? They're vulnerable to the ultimate attack. You shut down the internet, and you're not going to be able to communicate without an alternative. If you don't have a way to talk to other people, and your cell phone stops working, and your internet stops working, and your pager stops working, and every single electronic tool that you have that's communicating off of this backbone that's controlled by what amounts to two companies within the entire United States, once that's off, then that's it. So there's your first and most brutal and fast method. In addition to that, something like that could potentially eventually be used by hackers. Okay, we know somebody can break into essentially anything. So are we sitting around waiting until somebody breaks into the storehouse for SOP 303 and then realizes, oh, there's this huge switch that says turn off the internet, the easy button, poof, and the whole thing goes down? Is there protections in place? Or is it very similar to like some of our nuclear power plants where it's just open to the internet? on a SCADA system using admin admin for the username and password and nobody's just found it yet. Because that's how some of our other stuff is. What about a mistake? Sorry, archive.is is a little bit slow sometimes. Uh, Georgian, European, not Georgian, like devil went down to Georgia, okay. 75-year-old woman cruising around looking for copper. She's digging in the dirt, just trying to find some copper so that she can feed herself or her family. Goes down, boom, slams into a whole bunch of very, very nice little cables. Uh, she hit the fiber optic lane line to the entire country of Georgia. So they went down. Internet was down for several hours because she destroyed their method of getting out of the country, okay? So the entire place went dark. That was an accident. She didn't do it on purpose. 75-year-old lady just cruising around trying to find a way to feed her family, and she blows out the entire country of Georgia. It's not impossible for us to have a situation where somebody knocks out the internet just by accident. Uh, in addition to that, I give you all a link to the Telecommunications Act. Oh. So, there, it's already started, guys. It's over. Everybody go home. Yeah, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> uh, assignment of National Security and Emergency Preparedness Communications Functions. They have already created all of the documentation and everything necessary to start making the decision on how the internet is going to be handled, when it will be turned off. We have standard operating procedures. We have all of this stuff. It's just kind of in a haze because we don't have access to the whole thing. We know it's there. We know it's in use. We know that it has been used. And we have seen the effects of it. 
but we don't know the whole story. We don't know what tools are used. We don't know who is in control of it or the decision-making process on when it can and cannot be deployed. Uh, this is a really good breakdown. Now, I'm going to tell you what I've told everybody already before. Here's your news article. We know the name of this thing. Now go out and actually find it and read the real thing. This is an interpretation. Don't allow other people to just interpret your data, okay? That's kind of what we've become as a society, is we become this society where somebody else sits down and interprets everything and then hands it off to you and tells you, well, this is what you need to think about it. Don't let that be you, especially when it comes to something as important as this. Read the interpretation, great. Now you have an idea of what people are seeing in this, and then go actually read the acts. Go read your documentation. If you go through some of my older talks, particularly the last one and some of them before, I show you how to gain access to the courts. I show you how to gain access to these documents. All of that stuff is here. We're learning that here, okay? Use it. So now let's move to the digital stuff. This is more traditional. This is the stuff that the people at Freenet are going to need to worry about a little bit more than the shutting down the internet. If we get to the point where the internet shuts down, then we're probably going to be more towards the point of Bosnia. And if you're not familiar with Bosnia, go home and read about the Bosnian War, okay? They literally went from the night before having dinner, sitting around, playing games, and having a good time, to the very next day, guys who had never picked up a rifle before were hefting RPGs and blowing up buildings. Like it, overnight, the place disintegrated. And there are some terrible but very interesting stories from the Bosnian War. Denial of service. You can attempt to fill the network with junk data. We can, if when you're setting this up, it will literally ask you the maximum amount of space that you can provide to a free net installation is about 50 gigabytes, okay? It's not a lot. You're not, you're not gonna be doing a whole bunch with a whole lot of resources. This is very resource in intensive. You don't need to build huge systems with multi-cores and you know, terabytes of hard drive space. You can go with something as small as 20 gigabytes of hard drive space, just kick it off to the side. However, people potentially could upload junk data and then begin the process of making many requests for that data. Now, this is resource intensive. This is something that a state actor would be able to accomplish. Us, right now, probably not gonna be able to accomplish this kind of attack. What they're looking to do is drive down the speed and performance of the network in order to force an exodus of users. You wanna get people to stop using the tool, make it so slow that they can't use it. That's what they're looking for, okay? That's the attack. In reality, that attack is not such a big deal right now, simply because most people cannot wield the amount of power necessary to knock this network down. You start pushing data up to the network, well, guess what? You've connected another computer to the network. There's data being transferred around. It's all peer-to-peer. -peer. It's generally resilient against this kind of attack. Now, the next one's pretty important, because what we're going to get to is eventually some court cases. Monitoring. You're going to produce traffic with specific signatures. I don't want Tor traffic. I don't want I2P, Nutella. I don't, I don't use rTorrent from home. I don't even have that stuff installed on a system at my house. Everything remote because you don't want the traffic within your network at home. You don't want it to be shown on your thing. You don't want to be the guy who has a copy of Linux Journal and now you're on the NSA watch list, okay? You install Freenet, you pop open HTOP, I already went over it, search for the word Freenet, you're gonna find it. People can look for this stuff. In addition to that, they can look for specific traffic behavior local to your network and figure out what you're doing at your home. Um, I'm gonna jump further down just real quick. We have some court cases in here that are discussed where officers literally say, look, we knew they were using Freenet. We were suspicious that they were using it for wrong. We went to their home and performed a knock and talk. 
can just knock on the door and ask, hey, are you using Freenet? What's going on? Just get them to talk to you. And essentially, they said people who use Freenet are too smart and they refuse to talk to us. So they know what the traffic is, they can see it. They, even if it's encrypted, you can still tell what's going on. If you're using a VPN, it's very easy to figure it out. Even though the traffic might be encrypted, but you can see that you're using a VPN. Next one is another denial of service attack. Uh, you can block all the seed nodes. So if you're using this out of darknet mode, it's called normal mode. If you run it in normal mode and you block all of the seed nodes, then potentially anybody who tries to connect to Freenet is going to be unable to do so because essentially they just won't get the network data. This is a popular method of attacking uh, Freenet within like China. You try to use Freenet in China, they block all the seed nodes, you don't have any friends to kind of hook up with, you're never able to connect to the network. Uh, in addition to that, you can poison the seed nodes with bad information, like a public key. And once you've given them a hostile public key, then you could potentially surround the node and then you're going to be able to guess what data is stored on the box or manipulate the box to download certain data. Threat's kind of low, okay? Again, state actor level. You do something to make Uncle Sam mad, maybe this is gonna be a tool that's used. But a guy in your neighborhood who's war driving finds out your network security sucks on your wireless and starts poking around, this is probably not what you're gonna run into. And then your privacy threats. I have a bunch up here. And again, most of this stuff is Tor. Because remember, on your Freenet stuff, you have a much lower likelihood of running into a situation where people are doing dumb stuff with Freenet than they are with Tor. Potential, particularly because you can make money on Tor. Freenet, you really can't make any money off of this stuff. So the first site is Darkode. Uh, Krebs on Security did a talk on it. Essentially, they relied on Tor. They were super paranoid. They moved the site around all the time. You had to get invited. You had to know somebody. They were very careful about getting, letting people in. Somebody hooked up Brian Krebs, got him onto the site. He started pulling data from it, and eventually they tricked him into reporting on something, uh, like a honeypot kind of thing. They gave him some fake info. He reported on it. They figured out who his account was. They canceled his account. Well, lo and behold, they still got busted by the FBI, got taken down, okay? Bunch of arrests executed. They were selling all kinds of data on dark code. They were passing out all sorts of stuff. I mean, it was, a, it was a really bad site filled with really bad information, and they still got taken down, even though these guys were very good with Tor and very, very paranoid, okay? <coughs> Playpen, child pornography. This site goes up, it lasts for a little bit of time, and then the FBI takes over and starts using it as a honeypot. Now, we've talked about this before. When we've talked about the concept of um, what's known as... Uh, Entrapment. No, 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 no. That, that, that's a question as well. But uh, there's a, a concept called re-victimization. So they're running this site where people were victimized. And then they take it over. And they're still having to release this data essentially. So those victims are being re-victimized. They have no control over this. Um, I disagree with that. I don't think that you should do something like that. Now, they made a different call. Uh, and I wasn't part of this operation or anything like that. So who am I to say, right? I'm just a guy who works here. But Playpen got picked up by the FBI. The world's largest child pornography webpage, Child's Play, was run by the Australian law enforcement. And I got links to every single one of these items. So they essentially, somebody set this up, began the process of drawing people in to use the product, and then got caught by law enforcement. And the law enforcement took over and started using it to bust those people. Again, going back to re-victimization. Is it right? Is it wrong? I don't know. This is, a, this is above my pay grade kind of decision making going on here. But I want you all to see that's what's going on. Then we get to the Black Ice Project. Again, for those of you who are concerned about like PDFs and things like that, uh, I mark them PDF. So if you want to throw open a VM and pull down that PDF to interact with it or anything like that, go right ahead. 
but the Black Ice Project was run by ICAC, Internet Crimes Against Children. Okay. Now they made a claim that Freenet users could be compromised using a convoluted method to reveal the systems used to store Pacific data. Uh, the Freenet project refuted those claims. They said that this is not true. You can't, the mathematics used within their documentation are not correct and cannot be used. And in addition to that, here is the source code. And I might be able to pull this open or not, I don't know. There we go. So this section right here, what we've reached, this, this area here, is literally the code that was designed and implemented specifically to mitigate the vulnerability that is claimed within the Black Ice Project. Okay, again, why did I tell you all to read the source code? Because guess what? There you go. Hey, we found a vulnerability and this is how we mitigated it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I looked at the math and I talked to these people on IRC and this is still a little bit above my head. Like, I would not be able to come in as a subject matter expert on the mathematics used for dealing with this against their argument right now. I still need more time to familiarize myself with this, okay? So I'm going to... I'm going to switch back because I see some of you looking. No, that's okay. okay no, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I think it's important to read their actual statement here. Well, this is alarming. Their entire grounds for probable cause are based on an outright lie. Freenet's probabilistic decrement does not work at all in the fashion described in that paper, which is largely copy and paste from other documents, including Wikipedia. Five minutes of studying the source code would have led them to discover this. Four years of investigating and all that they've come up with is, hey, we're stumped, so let's just lie to the courts about this and hope that no one catches on. Now, this did end up with them arresting people. They actually arrested a whole bunch of people at, I believe, the, North, the University of North Dakota. So you can actually look up the Black Ice Project on Google, and then you will be able to see a bunch of arrests that were involved in this. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, for the Freenet people, this is probably not a hill to die on. You don't want to get up and base your entire claim on essentially a case that was proven and the guy admitted to doing. But in addition to that, I mean, in the defense of their project, mathematically speaking and with being able to show the source code, the vulnerability that was claimed is also claimed as mitigated. So is there a legal content? Let's start moving towards the content because this is important because we're talking about this now. Is there a legal content on Freenet? Yes, undoubtedly there is. There's illegal content on the Freenet. There's illegal content on Tor. There's illegal content on I2P. There is illegal content on pretty much every kind of system in the entire world. But under Freenet, it is considered much rarer. And in addition to that, even the Black Ice Project within their documentation, as you read it, states Freenet is pretty hostile to people who want to use that system for illegal activities. They're not real nice to those people. Um, there is a lack of server-side processing, databases, and the ability to use the tools available to turn a profit. So these are all major turnoffs to those individuals attempting to conduct illicit business. You're going to be more likely to find ramblings, rantings, complaints. I saw an entire web page dedicated to somebody who was essentially complaining about like waitresses and waiters that they dealt with. They had a free net site that you could go to and they would be like, I ate at Burger King today and man, so and so at Burger King really sucked. And that was their site. Uh, now, we're going to do a comparison against Tor. The Tor browser is essentially Firefox, right? And the Tor browser serves up everything. What's a huge vulnerability for the Tor browser? Two items. Anybody able to name the two items that are super massive vulnerabilities for? Clear tents? What's that? Exit nodes in, with uh, clear traffic? No, just for the browser. Oh. I don't know. CDN. JavaScript or CDNs. So the, the method of serving up that JavaScript and then Flash. And guess what? You still have to mitigate that. You open up the Tor browser and you're going to have to go in and do slides and move things and set stuff up. And you're going to have to do all of this to get that thing set up to stop JavaScript, to stop Flash, to stop all of that. 
Now, I again, I use the word claims. Freenet claims to strip JavaScript, Flash, and other attack vectors from sites. Now, they disagreed with my word claim. They said that we do. We don't use a, uh, we don't use a system of being permissive. Essentially, what Freenet's system does is you feed it a web page that you want to serve out to the world. It's going to look at it, and it's going to essentially only serve up things that it knows are safe. If it's not safe or it doesn't recognize it as safe, it will not serve it. JavaScript doesn't come through. Most CSS doesn't come through. You can't push CDNs over Freenet pages. There's a whole bunch of mitigation that's done on the Freenet side as opposed to on the browser side that you would be doing on Tor. So on Tor, you're responsible for more work to be done to defend yourself. Under Freenet, essentially, they're giving you a much reduced footprint on the internet, but they're stripping out anything like Flash, JavaScript, so on and so forth. Make sense? Everybody follow? Okay. <coughs> uh, I use the word claim because sometimes software updates, right? And potentially you can attack the, um, you can attack, if you know that the server's there, you can attack their connection to their upload or their uh, update servers, and you can try to inject your version in between. Uh, you can attack the source code that's used for building the object. I mean, there's, there's a ton of ways to try to mitigate their ability to block that. So if you're not checking for it and you're not paying attention and you get an update, potentially you could get a version of Freenet that does not strip out JavaScript or injects JavaScript. What are we seeing right now? We're seeing... Bitcoin mining and Monero mining and all of the cryptocurrency mining being pushed out off of CDNs. People included JavaScript that came from a source that apparently they couldn't trust. And we've got 4,000 US government web pages right now that if you go to them, some criminal is earning money off of crypto mining in your browser as you go to that government web page right now. Okay? So you don't want them to be able to push something to your your stuff. And for those of you who are not familiar with JavaScript, the act of being able to run code through somebody's browser is a lot more dangerous than just crypto mining. You can do some terrible things to people once you have that kind of access, okay? So what about that content? Well, is there content? Yeah. You know what I listen to? A really good radio drama, like the horse with the clapping. Like that, somebody made that and wanted to be able to distribute it. And so they made their own radio drama, and I sat down and I pulled it down and I listened to it, and it was really good. And it was made by like some guy and his girlfriend is what it sounded like. And they did different voices and things like that. And you could probably do the exact same thing on YouTube, and there would be no reason not to do that. There was nothing in it that needed to be private, nothing scary, nothing odd. It was just somebody telling a story but they wanted to do it on Freenet. They were contributing content. Simple blogs. People put all kinds of stuff on there. On your very first page, whenever you load up Freenet for the very first time and once you've got it up and running, they have blog links to all of the developers so you can see what they're thinking. You can see as they talk, all their discussion points. Everything that's going on with those developers, they put it up there on Freenet because they're contributing to Freenet. So guess what? It is your responsibility to build content whether it be running a blog about learning about computer programming or getting more into security, or if you want to talk about Phoenix Linux user group and coming out here to these meetings, whatever it is that you want to do, you need to start building content. And the reason we need to build content is because we cannot allow privacy tools to be synonymous with criminal enterprise. Okay? This is a responsibility that we need to take on. I, I, some people may not like this, but I call it the grandma test. Okay. When you sit down in front of grandma and she asks you, oh, what are you doing? And you say, I'm using Freenet. Oh, show me Freenet. What do you want to be able to show her? Memes, funny pictures, cats, whatever it is that you want to show, great. But do you want to sit down and be like, oh, I just use it because I like to look at all the illegal content 
that's going on, you know, I hit that back page and just surf. Is that, is that the only thing that you want to be using the tool for? No. So the network itself, that's our responsibility. The security of the network, the growth of the network, what is on the network. All of these items are your responsibility as a developer, as a person who's learning how to do this stuff. So you set up your little VPS and you provide a little space and you run a node and you use it and you inject content into the network. Whether it be art, maybe you like to doodle, who cares? I found a web page on this system that is essentially memes and I was filled with joy. They weren't good memes, but it was tons and tons of them. And that meant that somebody took the time to sit there and start putting stupid pictures with dumb words on top and posting them to the internet on Freenet. Fantastic. It's a start. Uh, I didn't find a joke web page. So if you like to tell jokes, build a Freenet site and start putting jokes on it. Send it to me. Let me know about it. I'll go to it. Uh, there is supposed to be search engines for Freenet. Nobody really runs a spider, okay? So if you're trying to search for things on Freenet, it's kind of difficult. The really, the main way that it works is indexes and word of mouth. So they'll usually do like announcements and somebody will come up and they'll be like, hey, I'm just announcing my micro blog. I jump on here and do X or I talk about something or they use indexes and uh, very similar to like the HTML indexes of old where you have a page and you send them a little banner and some a short blurb and then they kind of announce your thing. Anybody remember like the top 100 sites kind of lists? Sort of late, early-ish 90s kind of era of trying to get your site out there. Very, very old school like that. Rings. What's that? Like rings, like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. That was before Google, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I so, Google that didn't exist anymore. Let's go ahead and get to the answers and then we're going to open up for questions, okay? So Freenet, what is it? Well, it's a peer-to-peer -peer platform for censorship resistant communication and it uses decentralized data stores, our computers, to distribute information and also has a suite of free software used for publishing available. Did I mention that as you install Freenet, everything that you need to be able to push content to Freenet or build web pages on Freenet, all of that is included. So as you're reading the documentation and looking through the plugins, there's literally tons and tons of stuff that they include as part of it to allow you to still add content to the system. It's all there for you, okay? It's one-stop shop. You come in to the Freenet network and they give everything that you need to be able to work with it. So why does privacy matter? Well, it matters because it works as a limit on the power that others can exert on us. Personal data is valuable and can affect our reputations as well as be used to shape our behavior. Personal data can cause great harm. That's important. Walk away with that. Freenet functions by allowing users to anonymously share files, browse and publish free sites, and distribute information in a manner that provides protection against censorship. Not perfect protection, just protection. There is a level of protection here. And Freenet works as identical nodes that pool their storage resources in a censorship resistant manner. Now, what about Tor? Tor is reliant on many different pieces of software and provides access to the clearnet out into the world through Tor exit nodes, right? While also being a little bit more centralized. Freenet is more decentralized, provides in-house replacement tools for clearnet behaviors, and hosts content in a decentralized way in order to reduce the effectiveness of traditional DDoS attacks. So what is it? It's more robust. Freenet is more robust. It's safer. It provides a little bit more privacy and it gives you tools in-house instead of you having to try to develop a method to deploy a copy of Nginx as a Tor hidden service while also managing all the other aspects of it and then in addition to that understanding how the browser interacts with it. So if you're building a web page and you decide in a traditional manner to add a CDN as was mentioned or to push JavaScript from an untrusted source, well, guess what? All the users who are coming to your site and attempting to use it, potentially you're burning those people. Freenet is much more robust and protective against that kind of behavior. So let's get to the conclusion. Where are we really at? We gotta worry about our privacy. We gotta worry about being anonymous, but we also still need to worry about our authorship. 
Sometimes you need people to know who you are. Sometimes you need them to not know who you are. But these are all concepts that we have to not only focus on, but we have to juggle them. We have to make decisions every single day on where we are. In addition to that, we have a lot of threats. There are threats externally. There are people trying to break into other companies to gain our data. There is nothing that we could have done barring preventing them from gathering that data to prevent somebody like Equifax from essentially placing all of us at risk. Our companies bought into it. Our employers bought into it. Everybody bought into the idea of having the credit score and so on and so forth and all of these things that we did and then we have to pay for it. And everybody got a golden parachute but us. Okay? There are corporate, government, and private interests who are each working to end our right to be anonymous as well as to chill discourse and discussion. Information has become valuable to the point that many companies now subsist on the gathering of this data as well as dissemination of it in whole. All they do is work off of your data. It's your life, your pictures, what you do every day, where you go, all of your GPS coordinates, the tracking of your phone, making sure that they know what you're doing at all times. That's how they make their money. But it is you who provides that data. So what are you going to do? It is your duty to contribute to the defense of the internet and the right to privacy. We have to take a stand by employing tools that allow us to participate in civic discourse without fear of a heavy-handed response. You deserve the right to hold an unpopular opinion, to ask questions, and to learn. And no single group should hold a monopoly over discussion. Has anybody ever heard the saying, um, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend your right to say it to the death? Confucius, yeah. 5,000 sure. years ago. <laughs> so, I come from that that era slash background slash whatever. You have the right to learn things. You have the right to be wrong and to make a mistake. You have these rights and it should be okay for you to experiment with those things. So you can build a future of communication and ensure that we have the right to talk to each other and that people don't have the right to take away our discussions by being an advocate for free speech, providing the tools necessary <laughs> to have an anonymous network and to have open and civil discourse. And we should not allow any of our differences to become a muzzle because we must contribute to the health and welfare of the internet in order to reduce the chance that we will one day discover ourselves unable to use it. So don't allow the internet to become the Facebook machine. You need to develop your skills so you can ensure a future for the internet. So what are my final recommendations? Everybody should know these ones. Get yourself a PGP key. Even if it's just using Keybase, that's okay. Jump on Keybase. Start learning how to use it. Understand the concepts, and then you can go full command line interface like we all love to do. But start with Keybase and start registering things. Use Linux. We talked about it at the very beginning of the class, but you have this operating system sitting over here that is literally looking for ways to poke holes in your network to gain access to send telemetry data about what you're doing, or you can use Linux. Now, mind you, Ubuntu in uh, <coughs> their latest 18 release is going to have a opt-out only method of gathering your data and doing something very similar with telemetry. You should look that up. And you should be made aware that there are versions of Linux that are safer and more free than others, okay? Contribute to a privacy enhancing project. I recommend Freenet, but you can pick one. It doesn't matter. Find something that you like, find a tool that you're going to use, and start doing something. Use GitHub. Hey, contribute to this. There's some misspelled stuff in here. Jump on GitHub, pull a pull request, but start learning how to use these tools. We also need to develop relationships and build your own darknet. I can't tell you thank you enough for being here. For your willingness to come here and sit here on a Thursday night and learn about this stuff, well, guess what? Look around. You have people here in this room right now who are interested in the exact same things that you are. Everybody inside of this room right now cares about their privacy. They care about these tools. They probably care about Linux or they wouldn't be here. They're all here for the exact same reason you are. So if you're interested in building your own darknet, hey, guess what? We're all here. Network in the real world. And of course, one more time, can't Mentioned enough, contribute to open source projects. Uh, 
As well, for all of you, I've dropped some more PDFs down here at the bottom in the continued reading. Uh, these are uh, educational papers and some uh, paperwork that is written by one of the a gentleman who is working on his PhD as well in here. So if you want to kind of learn about how to attack peer-to-peer -peer networks, what kind of vulnerabilities they suffer from, and in addition to that, getting a better understanding of Freenet on a whole. Documentation, lots of stuff for you to read. Uh, we're getting close, so we got about 10 minutes. I'll open up for any questions. Anybody want to make questions or comments? Do you know what version of Java Freenet runs on and will it work with OpenJDK? I'm using OpenJDK right now, and I think it's the latest. Just whatever is provided by uh, Ubuntu Server 16.04. So, I mean, whatever that version is right now, I know it works, but I'm sure that you could experiment with trying some different versions if you were interested in doing so. Anybody else? Yes. So about the Black Ice Project. Sure. Uh, assuming that their claim is right that they mitigated that vulnerability or, or patched it beforehand, does that mean that the whole Black Ice Project is a case of parallel construction? You know, and it's funny that you would bring that up because I made that question as well to some people that I was speaking to about it. I don't know. I can't tell you and I'm not part of it, but um, when you read... So when you read the documentation on one of the individuals who was arrested, he was a police officer who worked for a university in uh, North Dakota. What ended up happening was somebody walked in, he had his computer turned on, it was unlocked, they grabbed his laptop and left. Now within the warrant that was gained, it said that they were able to figure out that he was trading in illicit images by his use of Freenet. And they reference those that line of code for that now for them to know that it was on his laptop and the fact of the matter is is that they arrested several other people at the exact same university uh, I don't know good question though very very good question anybody else no it's your it's your five minutes yeah, off topic question sure yeah. Do you have any insight on, on a company Huawei and AT&T Verizon's decision not to sell their phones anymore and the government and agencies claiming to not trust Huawei phones and products? So, good question. So, the question that was posed about the, the cell phones and the situation with uh, <coughs> essentially every single government agency here saying don't buy any kind of Chinese stuff. Um, I'm going to start off with if you go online and you look in the right corners, you will be able to find places where we have images of individuals who work in like the government seizing cell phones and installing chips on those cell phones in between delivery, between the manufacturer, it ends up on the doorstep of a three letter agency, they install stuff on it and then they deliver the cell phone to somebody. Okay? So, historically speaking, we, we being the United States, have participated in a level of gaining access to people's devices and data. Now, the Chinese obviously are able to do that as well. Now, it's also much easier for them because most of those devices are built there. Uh, the government has a very strong hand in how those devices are built, and in addition to that, has control over the manufacturing process. And you can just make the assumption that whatever government it is that you are working with within their borders or with devices that is available to them, they have access to that stuff. If you've heard of Five Eyes, Nine Eyes, or Fourteen Eyes, the, the groups of governments that work within the, I guess, their rules and law sets to spread and uh, share information, all of, that, all of that is already in place. And so you have like the BRICS. Have you ever heard of the BRICS? Brazil, um, Russia, India, and China. So the BRICS, essentially, that's their five eyes. They work together. Brazil, Russia, India, China, that's their group. They have a, a thing amongst themselves. We have a thing with, like, us and Britain. Um, so when our government comes out and says, hey, if you're using these products, your information is going to China, well, that's already been proven. There's several instances where... Chinese 
manufacturers have added information or code to devices, sent them over here, and gathered our data. You can just Google it. I mean, it's, it's been happening over the past few months. It's all still relatively recent. They do the exact same things we do. So even without knowing anything like solid about their programs, I can tell you for every program we have, they have an equally implemented method of gathering information and data. So for a lot of people, and it's, this worries me, this actually worries me on a personal level because I've spoken to people who have told me, well, I'm more afraid of my personal government than I am of Russia or China. I would rather use a Chinese phone and send all my data to China than for it to be here where they could use it against me. And hearing those statements from people, that has concerned me. Because either way, when you send that information out into the, the Aether, out into, into wireless networks and stuff, you're sending it to somebody. Somebody's gathering it. So it comes down to who's grabbing it first. So does that help answer your question in any way? Sort of. <laughs> Is it, it's not really what you want to hear. So, so, if, I, so I, if I go through all that, I can build a free net node. And then you have a free net node also? I have a free net node. I do. So just maybe email you and then just. Yeah, yeah if you want to. Send me a message and I'll. I'll add you. Just don't use Gmail. Yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you can, you can, you have my signal? Throw it on signal. If you don't, hit me up here in a minute. Yes. Every now and then I travel to China. Uh huh. And my issue is while I was in China, I wasn't able to uh, access the US website as freely and easily as I can. I wish to. So what are the options that I have? Because I used to be able to use the open VPN just access to my office. From there I can access US you know, website, and emails, what have you. Uh, nowadays the, the Great Wall of the firewall of China block those uh, many sites pretty pretty stringently. I was wondering uh, using the free net or other you know, method would allow me to actually escape the firewall. Freenet will not. So Freenet's not going to allow you to get over the get out of the firewall. Well, and what the Great Firewall of China is doing now is what they do is called uh, deep packet analysis. And essentially, what they're looking for is they use what amounts to an artificial intelligence to look for specific behaviors within your traffic. So certain SSL connections, so on and so forth. And as they view that. Uh, the system is actually designed now to automatically evolve to block. So even if you were to change ports for OpenVPN and you were to go move from, you know, whatever the default port is to 443 to try to make it look like you're just working off of SSL traffic, it'll look deep enough and figure things out and it'll watch it long enough to eventually decide, you know what, this is probably you using a VPN and just cut you off. Uh, and what you'll notice as it does this is your internet speed will slow down gradually until finally they just cut you off because they're checking and watching and monitoring. Um, so, and who knows, they may change this because somebody's going to sit here and watch this on a video. But if it was me, one of the things I would experiment with is making sure that you have a machine that's open outside of the firewall that allows an SSH connection and then do some port forwarding and try to use the browser through like X window. Um, you, can, you can X forward and essentially run everything on an external server and just get it to come over SSH. Do you know if port 22 is blocked or do they have any problems with you using port 22? Port 22 is okay seems to be, but, but um, uh, we open VPN, we change ports. Uh, it will only work for a day or two. Uh -huh, and then it shuts it down. <laughs> wow. So, so yeah, my recommendation would be get the server running and use either X forwarding or port forwarding through a tunnel and run everything external and just get it running outside of the firewall so that the only thing that you have coming into the network is that single tunnel and that may that may be a lot better for you. One of the ways we tried with limited success is we 
in China, it still allows people access to Amazon services. So we have an Amazon EC2 machine. Actually, that Amazon is uh, physically in Amazon centers, data centers in Japan. Okay. So we using that as a jumping board to 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 offer. <coughs> Did that work? So yeah, it's, but it's pretty slow. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You're that's going to be the trade off to to get around their censorship. They're they're going to try to slow you down to the point where you just give up on using it. That's what they're looking for. Either block you or make it unpalatable. I think I heard that Amazon. But it won't allow them to get out. That that's the issue. The idea is it's not one that's owned by Amazon. It's, it's still, still going to be owned by because the Chinese government essentially demands access. Yeah, the service is going to be in China, and basically they told Amazon that if you want to sell these two instances, you have to do it from inside China. Right. And then they said, here's a vendor that would love to host your operation. Yeah. And that's, that's par for the course, no matter what you're doing, even in manufacturing, anything like that. You have to work through the government. I, talk to me afterwards or get my key base. Hit me up on key base. I'd like to discuss with you because I, I would be interested in having a discussion with you, okay? Anything else? No? Well, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for spending your Thursday with me, and I hope this was educational in some way.